everyone. Uh, you're getting close to the end of the conference, but the last uh, session of track I is about uh, symmetric key designs. We will have four talks. Um, the first one is by Evit Sandy Konic from National University of Singapore. The title of the work is How to Use Meta, Meta Heuristics to Design of Symmetric Key Primitives. Um, Evit Sandy, the stage. Thank you for the introduction. So meta heuristics are automatic tools. So first let's take a brief look of these automatic tools and try to understand what kind of problem we are trying to solve. Automatic tool, it's an algorithm that solves a particular problem and it's feasible to run. Okay. So the emphasis is it's feasible to run. We only consider those algorithms. In symmetric key crypto, we are using various uh, automatic tools, both in analysis and in design. So in the analysis part, in the several uh, years, we've seen an explosion of these automatic tools for analysis. Now we have tools that are, can automatically check the security bounds of ciphers and hash functions again, against various differential attacks, linear attacks, mid-in-the-middle attacks, and so on. On the other hand, in the design part of symmetric crypto, we also use automatic tools that usually are used to find good ground transformations. For example, good S boxes that satisfy certain criteria, good diffusion layers, and so on. But also, we use analysis tools for design of entire primitives, so not only the round transformations. How do we do this? Well, basically, we assume that we have analysis tool and check some primitive against certain type of attack, and then we fix a class of primitives, and then we apply this tool to the class of primitives. For example, when the class of primitives is small, what kind of tool do we use? We use brute force. Okay? So for example, if you, find, uh, if you want to find better shift rows, offsets in AES, that produce uh, new AES, tweak AES, that has better resistance against uh, impossible differentials, well, we know that we already have the tool uh, that finds, that evaluates cipher against impossible differential attacks. And because the number of possibilities of new shift offsets is uh, very small, we can go through all of them, to each of them apply the tool, and find the best shift offsets, okay? So, when the class uh, of primitives is small, we use brute force. When the class of primitives is large, of course we, root, we use random search. So, for example, if you find, if we want to find better mixed call matrix in AES, and produce better resistance against impossible differential attacks, Again, we assume we, are, we, we have the tool, we have the method that returns the security bound of any cipher against impossible differential attack, and you should know that such tool exists. But now in this case, there are a lot of possible mixed call matrices, so we only have to pick a small subset and find the best among them. Okay. So the question is, and this is what we are trying to answer, when the class is large, when the class of primitives is large, can we come up with a better strategy, something better than random search? This strategy has to be efficient, at least not worse than random search. It has to be versatile, it can replace random search in many cases, and of course it has to be simple, otherwise people will not use it. And this new strategy are metaheuristics. So what is a meta heuristic? It's a partial search algorithm used to find sufficiently good solution to an optimization problem. So we have some objective function f of x, and we are trying to find the, uh, the optimum, the maximum, let's say, of f of x. Now, the <laughs> emphasis here is sufficiently good solution. Okay. Same like in random search. The random search will not find the best, but will find some sufficiently good solution. Same thing with meta heuristics. So why are they called meta heuristics? Because they are high level heuristics, as we will see, so kind of universal. So what are the main features? The first thing, approximation. Whenever you use them, you should understand that they not necessarily will, will return the, the maximum. On the other hand, they are practical. You know, after, they, after we decide to stop them, they're going to provide some good solution. <coughs> and they also seem like random search require only a black box, black box, box access to the objective function, they are very, very simple to implement. Almost as simple as random search. So the best analogy for meta heuristics is Swiss Army Knife. Now, Swiss Army Knife is a universal tool. It can be applied to many different tasks, but for none of the tasks is the best, right? Like 
it has the fork, it has the spoon, it has the knife, you can do a lot of things with them, but actually if you take a full-blown knife, it's much better than the Swiss Army knife thing. So same thing with metaheuristics. They're really good if you are trying to solve a particular problem and you have no other way of solving it. But it doesn't mean that what metaheuristics will return is the best possible solution. So try to use them when you don't have any other better approach. Otherwise, try to come up with your own algorithm. So there are various classification of metaheuristics according to the solution type. Some of them try to find a local optimum of the objective function, some try to find the global. Also according to the candidate set size, we have a single and population based. So what's a single based? So all of these metaheuristics, as we will see now, they're iterative. So they work with some candidate solution and through iterations they try to improve the solution. So these single metaheuristics work with one solution whereas population-based metaheuristics work with a set of solutions. And also usually all the, most of the metaheuristics are inspired by some nature phenomena, but there are some that are not inspired by nature. So this is an incomplete list of different metaheuristic algorithms. So you can see there are a lot of them, and we're going to focus on two very famous uh, metaheuristics that have been uh, here for a while, and those are similarly annealing and genetic algorithms. So first let's focus on simulated annealing. It tries to find the global optimum. It works with a single solution through the iterations and it's nature inspired by annealing in metallurgy. So simulated annealing is very similar to hill climbing algorithm, uh, but it has a special mechanism that escapes getting stuck at local maximum. Let's take a look how. So this is the hill climbing iteration, right? Hill climber, you have a candidate, it's an iterative uh, algorithm, so you have a candidate solution, some point, and then from this point you're trying to build another point and another point so that eventually you're gonna find the optimum. So as you can see, it's extremely simple. So basically if you have some uh, candidate here, you just generate another candidate in the neighborhood of that point, and if develop the function when that point is higher, you accept that it's a new candidate. It cannot be simpler than this, right? So for example, if we try to run this, this is our initial candidate X. So we select another candidate in the neighborhood, another, another. All of these have higher values for the this is object function. So we accept them. Another, so if it's lower uh, value, we cannot accept, we have to go back. And eventually, Hill Climber will find the optimum, but only the local optimum. As you can see, it always gets stuck at local optimum. So unless we start somewhere here, we'll never find the global optimum. And this is our task. So this is the hill climber iteration. And as you can see, similar to annealing is very similar, just has a few more lines of coding. So same like hill climber, it generates a new candidate in the neighborhood. If the value of the function this, on, this, on this new candidate is better, then it accept. But if the value of the function is worse, it can still accept, but only with some probability that depends on the step of the iteration. So at the beginning, it will accept solutions that have much worse value of the objective function than the candidate value, and then later this probability reduces. So this is the probability here. So it has additional parameter, which is the temperature T, which changes with time, getting reduced and reduced. And with this thing, it reduces the probability of accepting degrading solutions. So it's similar to annealing, for example, if you start here, we generate a new point, it's better available for the objective, fu objective function, we can go up, 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 up. And actually, we can even go down, because if this value here falls, this random number between 0 and 1, Smaller than this, we can still go down, but not always, of course. It depends on this probability. So we go up, down, and luckily we can escape and move to another kind of hill and then find eventually the global maximum. Okay. So as you, as you can see the parameters of simulated annealing, you have, you have to, we have to define this neighborhood function, the initial temperature T, and this how we reduce the temperature, which is called the cooling schedule. So that's the whole algorithm. Now let's move to genetic algorithms. Genetic algorithm also tries to find global optimum. 
and it's population based, so uh, it works with a set of candidates, and it's also nature inspired based on genetic reproduction and survival of the fittest, as we'll see now. So as we said, it's a population based, so you have a population of n individuals, basically a set of inputs to the objective function, and because it's a relative algorithm, from this generation, you're trying to create a new generation of individuals, new set of uh, inputs to the objective function. So how we do that? Using two methods. The first is reproduction, same like in nature. We take two uh, candidate solutions and we produce new two candidate solutions. <coughs> and the second method is mutation. So basically we take one candidate, we produce a new candidate by changing slightly the candidate. Okay. So how do we decide who becomes parents in this reproduction part function? and who gets mutated. Well, <coughs> parents are decided with something that's called selection function, which is bias towards individuals on which the objective function achieves higher values. Okay? Same like in nature. If on these inputs, the objective function is better, then there is a higher chance that this input will become parent, and it will kind of pass the genes in the next generation. So a single input can become parent several times. For example, this point can become parent in another reproduction function. And some of the inputs will never become parents, those usually that have very low value of, of objective function. And there are different types of selection functions. And then let's see how the reproduction function works. And this is why it's called genetic algorithm. So basically the inputs, the parameters of the objective functions, it can be a vector. So the arguments are called genes. So this means, for example, here we have four, it means the objective function takes four inputs, and these are the value of the inputs of this candidate. So if, when we use the reproduction, or so, also called crossover functions, for example, we have two parents, we have to produce two children. So basically, we, we assign the random genes from the parents. So these children takes these two genes from these parents, and these two genes from this parent, and vice versa. And that's how we produce a new candidate input to the objective function. <coughs> And mutation, as I said before, is likely changes some of the individuals with very small probability to change the individual, and it changes very slightly. For example, here, zero goes to three. Okay, so that's the genetic algorithms. So we have now two metaheuristics, simulated annealing, a genetic algorithm, and we try to apply to design of symmetric primitives. So when can we use the metaheuristics? First, we have to clearly define the optimization goal. Okay. So the objective function has to be has to produce numerical value. It has to be clearly defined. We use metaheuristics when, of course, the cell space is large. Otherwise, we can always use brute force. There is no need to use metaheuristics. And also, we have to make sure we understand that metaheuristics not necessarily will produce the optimal solution. Okay, it will produce sufficiently good solution in most of the cases. <coughs> so we try to apply these metaheuristics to two different kind of symmetric <coughs> primitives. First is skinny, which is a new tweakable block cipher. Uh, why to skinny? Because it's kind of also highly optimized and designer also use various automatic tools to produce the parts of the design to be very secure and very efficient. I'm not going to explain how it works. Basically it's very similar to AES, but it has some key schedule, and then in the key schedule we use this 16 element permutation of the nibbles. And apparently the permutation that the authors proposed was found with a brute force in the restricted space. So not 16 factorial, but small space. And because it's smaller, they can use brute force. And they restrict the space because it's very efficient in this space. So what can we do, for example, if can we find a better permutation if we remove this restriction? Maybe the cipher is not going to be more efficient, but maybe it's going to be more secure. So if we want to formulate our optimization problem and apply the metaheuristics, first we have to define the input. And the input is a 16 element permutation. So the input to the objective function is 16 element permutation with some additional restrictions that I'm not going to go into details. And the objective function, same like designers, we want to uh, return security bound of skinny against related tweaky differential attacks. And this part, so basically there is these automatic tools 
that if you provide a cipher, it will speed out the bound against impossible differential attacks. Uh, sorry, against related key differential attacks. And this, uh, this approach is based on integer linear programming. Uh, the designers already use that, so we're going to use as well this function. So they need this permutation, and then the objective function will say how many active boxes are in the best related key differential trail when this permutation is used in scheme. So that's our. That's the formulation of our problem. So if you want to use the simulated annealing, of course, we have to define these few parameters. What is the neighborhood function? So because the input is a permutation, it's a neighborhood function, we can use one or two swaps in the permutation. Then we have to fix some initial temperature. And we have to define the cooling schedule, in other words, how the temperature reduces over time. And this is quite a typical cooling schedule. It's called inverse cooling. And if you want to apply genetic algorithms, we also have to define some parameters, the population size, the selection function, we use all four different types, mutation, and crossover. So all of this is quite easy to, to define, maybe, except maybe the crossover. Because the inputs are permutation, the outputs also have to be permutation, so we cannot just take random genes split in the children. And these are the results of the optimization. So this is the number of evaluation of the objective function we use. This is the original. In the original paper, the objective function is 27, which means 27 active S boxes in the best trail for some number of rounds. We actually managed to achieve 33 and 33 with around 1,000 evaluation of the, of the objective function. And we also applied to another uh, symmetrically primitive, some AES-based constructions for, from FSC. I'm not going to go into details how they look like. Anyways, we applied to these six types that were already presented in that paper. So this is what originally was presented, and this is what we got. So as you can see, we kind of managed to improve these six out of seven possible that were given there. And some, some of the improvements are, are quite high. As you can see, another interesting thing actually simulated annealing, which is even simpler than genetic algorithms, outperformed genetic algorithms in this particular case. So to conclude, metaheuristics are very handy automatic tools. So when the search space is large and we have no better idea what to do and how to cover the space, how to find something in the space, the next, the next best thing I would say are application of metaheuristics. They're extremely easy to implement. It can be optimized, can be used to optimize designs according to other aspect criteria, not only uh, security, as long as the objective function is clearly defined. So, from my personal experience, because I learned about this metaheuristics only a year ago, and from all the experience, experiments I've done, I can say that how metaheuristics work, it's basically at the beginning when you start trying them, because all of these things that I implemented actually require an enormous amount of time, because the objective function is very expensive, this integer linear program. So basically, to query the objective function, we need maybe a few minutes, because it has to produce a solution. So they are very good at the beginning, immediately provide some okay solution, the metaheuristics. But then if you find to want to improve this solution, it takes a lot of time. So maybe you can use them only at the initial stage when you don't have any better idea how to fix some parts of the design. So just run the metaheuristics, let them output some okay solution. Then you can maybe with manual analysis try to understand why this is a good idea and then build even better. That's all. Thank you. We have plenty of time for questions. I have a, a comment and a question. The comment is that uh, uh, automated uh, search uh, techniques have a very long history and the uh, S-boxes of DES were actually chosen by the designers at IBM by uh, searching with a large cell space uh, using all kinds of shortcuts uh, to find the best S-boxes according to uh, differential uh, property criteria. Yes. Now, my question is the following. Uh, in order uh, uh, to have some success in all the meta heuristics, you need a continuous function, objective function. Because if it is totally random and there is no connection between the point and its neighbors or small uh, variations of uh, the neighbors, then uh, it's useless. It's just like uh, random search. 
Now, when I'm trying to think about the effect of changing the order of uh, uh, the permutation uh, of the uh, nibbles in uh, the design, and I assume that you are repeating it uh, from, from one subkey to the next subkey to the next subkey, I don't see any reason why the function uh, is going to be continuous. I can see a situation in which uh, you have a very good solution and you uh, make one uh, involution, uh, you permute two elements and you get a terrible solution. That's absolutely so, true. Yes. So can you explain why it succeeds when because the function is not continuous? There are such cases as you mentioned, but there are other cases where this doesn't work. So in some of the cases when you switch a little bit, it gets improved a little bit. You switch a little bit, it gets improved. So yeah, there are cases when you switch, it goes from really good to terribly wrong. But there are cases where it so does it's mostly continuous, you'll say. I cannot fully describe, I don't know how it looks like, but... There are easy measures of uh, how continuous a function is. You just uh, take pairs, random pairs of uh, neighborhoods, uh, neighbors, and see uh, what's the difference between them. And uh, uh, it will be very interesting to look at the standard measures of continuity, um, whether your objective function is sufficiently yeah, that's a good idea, actually. I have not done that. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? So actually, if you go further with this idea, if you assume at some point you have an objective function that is continuous, maybe it's not that far from being differentiable. And so you could try to use gradient descent algorithms, yeah. stochastic gradient descent, for instance, yeah, uh, yeah, like we do in neural networks, to uh, find an optimal solution uh, much, much quicker. Than Definitely. Have you tried that approach? Definitely. Just these functions, the objective functions, are not elementary. For example, imagine a function that, in a background, runs integer linear program that outputs some number. We don't know how the function looks like. We are just squaring the function as a black box. Of course, if you know there is a mathematical uh, definition of the function, we are going to use mathematical methods. This applies only we have no idea how the function looks like. We can just square it. And usually these functions are very expensive. So like, you cannot do 2 to the 20 in a second. Actually, as I said before, one query can cost minutes. So there is no, we cannot use math. Yeah. No method of the optimizations will work. And I had another question, which is, is, is there anything open source? I mean, can we reuse these tools? Your, your uh, I have not shared, but yeah, sure. I mean. Okay. The program we've seen, it's very trivial to, to program, but I can share, yeah. yeah. Uh, because probably a, a lot of people would have very, I mean, it could help you mm. improving that kind of okay. things. And um, if you were to share this on GitHub or whatever, maybe you could have some, some people uh, That's willing to help. Mm -hmm. I would be willing to Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm just wondering, did you compare the result, I mean, better permutation using random search? I mean, you just wrote uh, annealing algorithm and genetic algorithm, yes. but without, like, <coughs> to compare the result using random search. I mean, is, I, is it better? Or? No, because... No, I didn't. Straightforward answer is no, I didn't, because I assume... I assume that what the designers proposed, they already use something more advanced than random search. That was the assumption. Actually, you just use, like, you relieve the constraint permutation. I mean, actually, it should be like uh, um, 1 to 6 should be just that block to block. I mean, you just relieve constraint in skinny schedule, right? Yes, yes, yes. And it should be better. I mean, using, I mean, it could be better. Even you. Yeah, yeah, of use course. I completely agree. Yes, yes. It's not completely fair comparison. That's why I have the second case <coughs> of this AES based constructions where it's completely fair comparison. The thing is, with Skinny, actually, I found out all, only at the end that they have this constraint. So I ran the whole search for two weeks. And then I found they have this additional constraint which I didn't take into account. And then I didn't want to throw away the result. It's not completely fair. It's, it's not a surprise that I got better numbers. So I come from a point like, OK, what if we relax 
That's why I'm saying we are relaxing. What if you relax, can we come, can we come with something better? I'm not claiming I produce better. I was claiming this, but no, I, I correct because I, because of this thing. Thank you. Uh, I just have uh, one more question. I uh, welcome it on what uh, Ali was uh, saying. Um, about the function, my guess is that the function is uh, flat most of the time, like locally flat, then you get bumps and then it's flat again because if you change something, the best differential bus will still remain the, the, the same. Uh, I guess that's what the function is. Um, and I got one question, I'm sorry I arrived two minutes late for your presentation, uh, but does your, your program actually output the, the differential bus or just give you some bounce? Uh, it can output. It's so, you know, if you, in, Guro, in Gurobi, you can actually output the differential that you found. In the integer linear program, I use Gurobi solver. Yeah, okay, so you use that inside, so you pull over. Yeah, if I want, it can output. Thank you. <coughs> just look how much time we have. Sorry. Uh, I think we are running out of time already. We can keep it. If it's short, you can go on. <laughs> it's very short. Uh, what's the improvement uh, rate across your 1,000 iterations? Does it uh, uh, improve continuously and you stopped at 1,000 only because you did it more time or uh, did it uh, flatten after 500 or can it stand it up? <laughs> it kind of gradually similar to it gradually improves. Then it has a big jump, then it goes down. It kind of, yeah, it's improvement, and then it kind of reaches some plateau, and then it stays there. So if I increased it to uh, 10,000, you don't expect the results? No, I don't, I don't expect. Thanks. Thank you.